Great. Well, thank you, uh, everyone. And um, my name is Gerald Arthur Nealdon. I'm the director of the Spatial Analysis Lab at the University of Vermont. And so, of course, whether it's managing your urban forest or uh, investigating some of the relationships between tree canopy and all of these other variables out there, it's rather difficult to do if you don't know what you have. So I'm going to talk about some of the work that I've been involved in in mapping the urban forest from above. Um, before I get into my talk, um, I hadn't given a lot of thought to the prestige of being here at the National Academy of Sciences. It was kind of ticked off that I had to fly on Sunday and miss some good skiing in Vermont. But um, I boarded the plane and I ran into my good friend Jonathan uh, Goldsmith here. Many of you, of course, know him as the most interesting man in the world. And he asked me, he said, what are you doing, Charles? I said, well, Jonathan, I'm flying down to DC for the National Academy of Sciences. And of course, he said, uh, you know, I don't always attend urban ecosystem workshops, but, uh, but when I do, they're held at the National Academy of Sciences. So I think that just says a lot about this, this workshop and certainly gave me a new perspective. Um, so in a nutshell, the, the work that, the, that I do and, and, and others do on uh, this front of mapping from above um, really involves taking this data, which is acquired by serial, aerial and uh, satellite platforms, um, and it's very, very detailed nowadays, of course, submeter resolution imagery. So it's wonderful. We can see lots of information. And then taking that data and then turning it into, into, into useful information, such as tree canopy maps from which we can compute area and all those other great things. And the rationale for doing this really was posed by not so much researchers, but the managers on the ground. And they really had two questions that sort of forced us to move in this direction. Uh, one was, how much tree canopy do we have right now? We call that the existing. And then the other question was, as it related to setting tree canopy goals, is how much room do we have to plant trees, which we like to call the possible. So the existing, what you have now, and the possible, how much land you have available to plant trees. Once again, with the, this information sort of being initially used for urban tree canopy goal setting. Um, and when we started doing this, there were other canopy maps out there. This is a canopy map produced by the USGS. We're in New York City right now. Each of these squares here is 30 meter on a side, and the darker the green means higher percent amount of tree canopy. These maps are out there. They're available for the entire US. However, in urban areas, they begin to break down a little bit. And they begin to break down because if we show the high resolution imagery for that area, we see that such data are very, very good at capturing these large forest patches. Uh, not so good at capturing all these street trees and smaller patches of trees. And these trees that we know have tremendous value both from ecosystem services and culturally. So we felt it was important to improve on the mapping a little bit. And it's important to improve on the mapping because from a research side, of course, we want to look at a lot of correlations or relationships or causation between tree canopy and other things. So Doug talked about the work he does and maybe he's studying the albino white spotted blind inferior Valley Mountain Toad there on one end, and he wants to see it, how that relates to tree canopy, of course. And depending on which data set you have, maybe the curve looks like this, or maybe it looks like this. So getting accurate estimates of tree canopy become very important. And they become even more important when we consider these things within a social context. We have to keep in mind that within urban areas, our tree canopy is managed by thousands, tens of thousands, or in cases of large cities, hundreds of thousands or perhaps even millions of land owners. So what we have here in the red lines are the property parcel data. So it's very important that we consider tree canopy in relation to the management structure of that landscape. Something that's difficult to do when you've got data that only picks up large patches in parks and things like that, compared to what's really on the ground, which are all those trees out there. So this is the, in yellow there, you see the tree canopy map. So these are now to the point that they're, they're very accurate. We can quantify tree canopy even down to the individual street tree level. And when we've got good data, we can pick up trees that are around six to sort of eight feet high. Uh, there are some real challenges to mapping in urban areas, though, especially in cities with uh, high three-dimension heterogeneity like New York. We've got a lot of shadowing going on and trees live in those shadows. So here's an area right here in New York City. We've got a huge building there. What's going on in that? It doesn't matter that we have six inch resolution aerial imagery here. We just can't see what's going on there. And so new technologies such as LIDAR, light detection and ranging, let's spin around, that's the same area right there, which rely on lasers that shoot out of the plane. And of course, who doesn't love lasers? They're just really cool. So we can enhance this a little bit and really highlight these areas that are tree canopy, areas that before were obscured 
but really begin to add up over time, especially once again when we want to relate this back to land use patterns and understand tree canopy at a very fine scale. The type of accuracy that we need can't be 80%, which is sort of normal cutoff in the peer-reviewed literature. We need very, very high accurate uh, data sets to do this. And the end result is some sort of really nice maps, both accurate in the two dimension and also give us some structure in the third dimension, thanks to that LIDAR data. So we don't actually just map tree canopy. We've sort of narrowed this down to what we think are seven land cover classes. And these aren't the only land cover classes we can map, but they're classes that we think we can map affordably. So we also have the tree canopy data there. We can pick up a sort of a grass and shrub, a herbaceous vegetation category, bare soil, water. And then we can also categorize, thanks to LIDAR, three different types of impervious surfaces. And we think that this is important because when you think about some of the best management practices that we need to apply to our urban areas, those treatments are going to differ based on the type of impervious surface out there. What you're going to do for a road is going to be different than a parking lot, and it's going to be different than a building. We often say, well, impervious surfaces are bad. Yes, they are. But how those impervious surfaces are being used is going to influence your best management practice. And you can always find fault with these maps. They're never, never perfect. But we had to do something that's affordable and gets us a reasonable amount of accuracy to make informed decisions. And then what's really nice about mapping things at a high resolution is we can begin to do analyses at multiple scales. On one end, we can focus on the individual property scale, where individual landowners are making their decisions. We can aggregate up to units of analysis that are meaningful in terms of socio-demographic information, such as the US Census data. We can look at units of analysis that are meaningful to people, their neighborhoods. Whoops, sorry about that. We can go up to the city level. And then what's really nice now is the technology's progressed and we've gotten much more efficient at this, that we can do these larger metropolitan areas and break down the political boundaries so that we can begin to look across jurisdictions at things like watersheds. So let's just look at some examples here. Here we have this area we've been showing before. Here we have the existing tree canopy. That's what we have right now, okay, at the individual property parcel level. And then in the next slide, we're just showing the amount of land that you have available to plant trees. And this is very, very detailed information, and people get excited about it. But we have to keep in mind, this is an exercise of mapping from above. It doesn't replace the fact that you need to go out to the field, as Dave reminds me now and then. I'm, very, I'm a forestry major, but I've become very comfortable with the soft glow of my monitor. But we don't want to misuse this information. You can't, we can't tell you what tree you should plant there. We can't tell you the species. We can't tell you the size. And it's because we don't know the soil conditions very well. We don't have good soils data in urban areas. We don't know the utility lines. We don't know the underground structure. We don't know all the things that are very important when you actually plant trees. So we have to keep in mind that this data can serve as a guide. It can help you prioritize. But we don't want to overuse its, its usefulness. But it is still very valuable from a planning tool. And I think one of the mistakes that we made in the past was sort of focusing and pushing this technology down to the urban foresters, rather than focusing on, I think, the people that it really benefits, which are the planners out there and the people that can put it into really thinking about what's our land use plan, what's our land cover plan, what's our sustainability plan for our city. And the integration with these other data sets are really, really valuable. Here we have an example from Pittsburgh here. Uh, Fortunately, they've got some great uh, crime data there at the neighborhood level we, we were able to get. And so here we have per capita crime. And the size of those circles there represents percent tree canopy. And we've done work in Baltimore that shows when you control for everything, tree canopy and crime are very closely associated with another, one another. And these maps tend to be very, very powerful to people. It helps to highlight sometimes things that they knew already, but now they have incontroversial evidence of, of areas which are low in tree canopy and how that may associate with other important things in their community. And we can do these sort of types of a strategic assessments. So this is what we call the tree canopy opportunity index. And it's just sort of a heat map and identifies areas in the city where you've got lots of land available to plant trees and also low amounts of existing tree canopy. Once again, we don't want to oversell this technology. We don't want to say, go ahead and plant a tree here. We're just saying, as you begin to prioritize your efforts out there, these are factors that you need to take into consideration. And as I mentioned, we're doing these over very large areas right now. So far, we've taken all from sort of the greater Fairfax County area, and we've mapped all the way up through Baltimore City and Baltimore County. And actually, we have a NASA project right now where we're doing one meter tree canopy for the entire state of Maryland. So our ability to map large areas is really great because when you do these small communities, you don't get to work on issues like watershed issues that cross these political boundaries. 
And when we can do these larger areas, we don't want to, we still need that fine level of detail and accuracy, but we want to be able to do it at a level where people can work across boundaries on things like watershed issues, which is what we see here, and this data can provide that sort of information. One of the most interesting findings from our work, time and time again, and I don't think this can be overstated enough, and uh, my colleague Morgan Grove is going to cover in more detail, but is under, it allows us to understand ownership patterns. And this holds true for the vast majority of urban areas out there, that residents are the primary holders, managers of tree canopy on the landscape. So you have to think about that. We often think about street trees. I don't want to negate the importance of street trees. I certainly love the two trees outside my house. But if you lose residents, if they no longer want to either plant trees or maintain the tree canopy they have, that's where it is. Your street trees here in the rights of way, very, very small percentage overall. And we need to keep that in mind when we move forward. And just some data to back that up here. Um, one of the nice things is, and Morgan's going to talk about this a little bit more, we can bring in these market databases, right? So before Starbucks, Walmart, or anyone goes out and they decide where they want to site a new store, they rely on this data. And here we are showing things on an urbanization gradient. And this is down to Fairfax County, D.C., Montgomery County, Prince George's County. So we can see we have these two areas here, the red and the, the green are the sort of primary sort of urbanized categories. So they've synthesized all the census information, purchasing information together. It's very powerful. So keeping in mind that the residents are the primary stakeholders in tree canopy, the primary managers, maintainers, all of that good stuff, we need to know something about them. And you see a lot of RFPs out there, which is help us plant street trees. Very worthwhile endeavor. But if you really want the biggest bang for your buck, you're going to convince the people out there to maintain or increase their tree canopy, the biggest bang for your buck. And it's important to understand those people with the fine resolution data combined with the market data we can. So let's take the less costless people here. We know how much tree canopy they have. We also know a lot about them. 50% of them are new Americans. They generally have two or more children. And they spend over a quarter of their income on their children. That's very, very different than these people, the social security set. They're retired. They live alone. They're in high-rise apartments. And they don't drive. Okay, we know where these people are, we know how much tree canopy that we have, they have, and then we can develop tactics to reach out to them because we have this data. Once again, keep in mind that the, primary, <laughs> the vast amount of your tree canopy is contained by these people. And it's also useful for sort of thinking about how our urban forest might change. This is data from Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, because we have data summarized at the property level, we can look at their property parcel database, we can look at the also look at existing tree canopy, throw in parcel value, land area, that sort of stuff. And what we see in cities such as Cambridge is this really interesting effect where there was this high, um, uh, really sort of the housing boom occurred in late 1800s, early 1900s. And so we see these properties that were built a little over 100 years ago that contain vast amounts of very tall trees, which we know from the LIDAR. And so what do we think is going to happen if these trees are now getting over to be 100 years old. What's going to happen when all this canopy here begins to die off all of a sudden? So we may want to think about reaching out to these people. We know this stuff because of the very detailed data that we have. So some other things that we're doing, in addition to sort of these, these sort of mashing ups with other data. This is data from DC here. And I think in the past, one of the mistakes we've made is we've said, well, this is how much tree canopy you have. And summarizing by parcels and all of that is good. But not all tree canopy is equal. So here we have it divided into three different patch sizes. Here we have the large patches, which typically correspond to park areas. Then we have these smaller patches, which are often in residential backyards and things like that. And then in the purple areas here, we have trees that either exist by themselves or with one or two little companions nearby. So we can tell you the amount of tree canopy you have, but then we can also break it down by patch classes. We can do change detection analysis. It's, uh, of course, as we set tree canopy goals, we often want to think about how we're doing for those goals. This is very, very challenging because there are errors associated with our data sets. And so there was a community in Virginia that did a press release about a year and a half ago, and they said they had, they had, they had increased their tree canopy, I think it was like close to 20% over 10 years. I mean, amazing. Um, and it's actually magic because what they had is they just had two different studies that had very different accuracy levels behind them. One done at 30 meters, one done at one meter. The one meter one mapped a lot more of the trees. and so the increase was false. But we can map change. And I think mapping change, we need to think of it as less of a thing of, well, 
how much tree canopy did we gain in five years? Because given the error rates, that's hard to compute. But if we can figure out where the change is happening precisely on the ground and what are the drivers of our change, that becomes much more valuable information. There's other neat things we can do, and I don't want to oversell this technology. This is results from Lake Tahoe. All the little dots that you see here represent individual locations of trees. And because it's Lake Tahoe and the trees are properly spaced and they have nice crowns, we can very, you can do an excellent job of telling you the DBH, the height to live crown, the crown radius, the crown volume, and all of those things. It tends to break down on the East Coast where our forests are much more messy and with the complexity of, of, of urban areas. Um, and of course, we know one of the things that you folks are really interested in is sort of the species mapping uh, and preparing for these annoying little things, whether it's the Asian longhorn beetle, our friend pictured here, or the emerald ash borer. And these are techniques that exist right now. The problem is they're very expensive. And uh, one of the things we continue to work on, and uh, now with our friends at NASA, is looking for these cost-effective solutions that can say, well, before a pest comes into my community, where are these trees located? But in the past, these studies have costed two, three, four, five hundred thousand dollars for an individual community, and that's a lot of trees you can plant as well. So until we can drive that cost down, until we can operationalize it, I think it's going to be part of the research domain. But Rich Hallett is here, so just harass him if you really think this is important. Um, I guess I'll make my final pitch at the end, which I think is something that's important to both our research of urban ecosystems and our management is that we need to move forward to a policy of open data. Uh, we've, they've funded a lot of these urban tree canopy assessments, a lot of great high resolution land cover exists out there. There's currently not a mandate for anyone to share that back to the community, to post it and make it available. And I would encourage, especially our friends at the Forest Service that fund these, to really think about that. I'm always amazed when I take the time to write up metadata and post our data sets. The number of emails I get over the course of the years about obscure graduate students that brought this information down and started looking at, you know, the relationship between the white albino um, mountain valley toad or whatever it was in relation to tree canopy. But this is important. The maps that we do, the high resolution mapping, can provide an important basis for doing a lot of other interesting work, things that I don't think we can always um, predict. So I think that was probably pretty brief, and then I'll uh, turn it over to Laura for uh, the next talk.